Amen. All right. Judges chapter 3. So here we finally have some judges in the, in the book of Judges. So it's, it's a real nice transition into Judges chapter 3 from Judges chapter 2. So God was kind of explaining to us in Judges chapter 1 and Judges chapter 2, you know, the reason for the book of Judges, not necessarily for the book of Judges, but the reason for the Judges and the situation that um, Israel had and gotten, that had gotten themselves into at the time. And now in Judges chapter 3, we get into the situation where we see the point in time where the Judges actually come um, into, you know, the picture. And in Judges chapter 3, let's just get right into it in verse number 1, you know, we get a little bit more clarity on the situation. God uh, explains a little bit more on the situation that the Israelites are in. In Judges chapter 3, in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now these are the nations with which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. So last week we saw that we don't want to be surrounded by our enemies and then turn on the Lord, right? That's a really stupid thing to do, right? So we don't want to be in that type of situation. That's where the Israelites were. They would go, they went into the promised land, they were surrounded by their enemies, and then they forgot the Lord. They turned on the Lord. And that's a bad situation to be. But here we see that there's another reason here. We see the reason that the Lord had for leaving them surrounded by their enemies. So we see last week that there was a reason that they didn't want to go in the midst of their enemies and then turn on the Lord from their perspective. But now we see here an explanation on why God left some enemies around them. And so he's very specific on who he left surrounding them. Look at verse number two. It's interesting because he says in verse number one, he says, you know, to prove Israel by them. And then in verse two, it says, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at least at, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. So there's a lot to be learned here, okay? So basically we're going to talk about this and apply this at the end of the sermon, but I just want to point out that, um, you know, we're going to dig into these first two verses at the end of the sermon with some application, but I just want to point out just one quick little side note is that this is the kind of parent that God is, all right? This is the kind of parent. He's like, you know what? I'm going to leave some enemies around you. I'm going to leave some enter enemies around you. So parents, you know, listen up, learn something from this. You know, dads, take the lead here, okay? Because the reason for spending time with your kids is not to just do everything for them, okay? Because they are going to need to be proven. You need to put some challenges forth for your children. Because look, I mean, when you're spending time with your children, you should remember that there should be lessons in everything. You know, spending time with your children is not just to, you know, give them candy and fun times all the time. It's to actually teach them and prove them so they'll be ready for when, you know, they have those challenges put forth to them. Because it will come. So watch for this. They will be surrounded one day. I mean, we are surrounded today. I can't imagine what it will be like for these kids that are growing up. So look, this is the kind of parent that God is. He put the children of Israel in the midst, and then he kept the enemies around them to prove them and to teach them war. Okay, look at verse number three. And then he goes into who he left around them. He says, namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Belhermon unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know. So what were they to prove? To prove is to test right? It's to test something. David said, you know, when he put on Saul's armor, he's like, I haven't proven this. He's like, I've never tested this. I've never fought in this before. So God is putting these people around them, putting their enemies around them to test them. What? Test them in what? Well, the test is right here. To know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their father by the hand of Moses. So if you remember Moses and Joshua and all the leaders were just constantly, you know, talking about when you get into the promised land, don't forget the Lord, don't forget. I mean, it's almost, it was so, so you know, repetitive that it's just over and over and over in the Bible. And it's so, you know, they would understand that, you know, they were going to need to hearken to the Lord. But how did they do in the test? Look at verse number five. And the children of Israel 
dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So here we see right away, here's your first problem. They weren't supposed to dwell with them. Okay, they were surrounded by them, the Lord said, but they weren't supposed to dwell with them. So what did they do? You know, they just, they moved right in with them, is what they did. And they took their daughters to be wives and gave their daughters and their sons and served their gods. So, I mean, they just, they, they, I mean, talk about fail. I mean, they failed the test. Okay, notice, you know, by the way, you know, not only did they move in with them and live well with them in the cities, but they began marrying, um, intermarrying into these people. You know, I mean, there's a, there could be a whole sermon on, you know, marrying the wrong person, marrying somebody who's not saved, because what happens? What happens? It always, by the way, it's always the bad changing the good. Just remember that in your life. Just tattoo that in your brain, because it's always the bad changing the the good. It's never the other way around. You know, women, this is a problem with women, young women especially. All right, they're like, they meet some, you know, some loser, right? Some unsaved loser, and they're like, I can change him. No, you can't. He's going to change you. That's what will happen. Okay, women are, they're, you know, young ladies many times. I've seen this so many times in my life. A young lady who's got this, you know, this I can fix him complex. Just get rid of that complex. Okay, find someone who's, who doesn't need to be fixed. Okay, or you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be broken by it, is what will happen. Okay, I've seen it many times. All right, look, the bad always changes the good. I mean, where are the stories in the Bible? Think about this. Where are the stories in the Bible of, you know, the good nation changing the bad nation? Like, they moved in with the bad nation, and they all got saved, and they all became Christians. Find me that story in the Bible. It doesn't exist. You know how they had to, they had to go to war with the bad nations? I mean, they were, that's why God didn't say, hey, go there and, you know, preach the gospel to the Canaanites. No, because God, God's wrath was already full against these people. They were already wicked. They had turned against the Lord. And God was done with those nations. And look, he knew that if they dwelled with them and especially married them, I mean, Solomon's another good example of this, that they would, and they, they, they turned literally to their false gods. I mean, they not only moved in with them, dwelled with them in their cities, married them, and then they turned on the Lord. It was the final thing. Look at Judges chapter 3 and verse number 7. So, I mean, the test, you know, if God was proving the nation of Israel, you know, the test is not going well at this point, okay? You know, they're not, they're not really passing. They're failing horribly. Look at verse 7. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Balaam and the groves. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Chushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. Uh, Brother Ryan did a lot better job on that. And the children of Israel served Chushan Rish Rishathaim eight years. Okay. Verse 9, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and, and the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So here's our first judge, Othniel. Okay, now this is Caleb's, the son of Caleb's younger brother. So we know who Caleb is. Caleb was one of the 12 spies. Caleb is one of the heroes of Israel. That He was one of the, the two people that was allowed to actually come in to the promised land. And his nephew becomes the first judge of Israel. I mean, look, turn to Joshua chapter 14. It, it kind of... It kind of doesn't really surprise me that it would be someone that's related to Caleb because toughness kind of runs in this family. And that's another thing. Dads, maybe you should think about, you know, think about, you know, Caleb and, you know, he's the uncle of the first judge. Just think about, you know, maybe your character, maybe that influences further generations of your family. You know, Caleb was an extremely driven, tough individual. Look at Joshua chapter 14 and verse number 7. This is Caleb speaking. He says, Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. So he was forty years old when he was a spy. Okay, and he says, and now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he had said, these 40 and 5 years. So he's talking about, this is 45 years later. 
So how old is he now? Well, the Bible tells us, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this fourscore and five years old. So here is Caleb speaking, and he was 40 years old when he was a spy, 45 years later, so 40 plus 45, he's 85, which is four score and five. A score is 20 years. He's four times 20 plus five. So he's 85 years old. And look at verse number 11. As yet... I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so it is my strength now, for war, both to go out and to come in. This guy is saying that I am still able to go fight and, and fight a, a physical battle when he's 85 years old. I mean, that's, that's a tough old man right there. Okay? Look at Judges chapter 3 in verse number 10. It reminds me of my grandpa, just a side note. I mean, I was, I, when I, before I moved out to the farm, I always had to tell my wife if I was doing any work, like putting fence posts in, she could never tell my grandmother that I was doing that work because my 89-year-old grandfather would come out there and help me, right? And, and I'm just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the cause of the death of my grandfather. You know, so one day I was putting in a, a, a fence for um, our chicken coop, and I was putting, there must have been 100 fence posts, and my grandpa caught word that I was putting in a fence. And so he's on his way over, so Jake, or Garrett, it was Garrett and I, went out and we made sure all the fence holes were dug, you know, with the fence, the post hole digger. And, you know, so when Grandpa got there, he wouldn't have to do any work. And, I mean, there was like a hundred holes. And I was inside the barn, sheeting the barn, and he came out and he, I was like, the holes are done, Grandpa, no problem. You just tell me how to, you know, do the carpentry inside here. He went out and he dug every single one of those holes eight inches deeper. So, anyway, that's just a, a side note. This, this story reminds me of that. Anyway, Judges chapter 3 in verse number 10. The Bible says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, so this is Othniel, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Chushan, Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Chushan, Rishathaim. And the land had rest forty years and Othniel the son of Kenaz died. So we see the first judge. So here's the pattern, right? The people turn from the Lord. This is the pattern that we learned from Judges chapter 1, Judges chapter 2. The people turned away from God. They, they went into servitude. They, they went into bondage. And God then had mercy upon them, and he sent a judge to free them from bondage. And that first one was Othniel. Look at verse number 12. And the children, here's the cycle. I mean, are we seeing a pattern? Are we seeing a pattern? The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel. That means he, he defeated them in battle and possessed the city of palm trees. That's Jericho, by the way. If you ever see that in the Bible, the city of palm trees, Jericho. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Of course, Jericho's kind of on the border, right? I mean, what was the first you know, city that, that the Israelites invaded? It was Jericho. When they were coming up into the Promised Land, there was Jericho. So it makes sense that you know, that's the first um, city that they would lose um, to uh, an invasion. So the children of Israel served Eglon the king of Moab 18 years. So first, they were in bondage for, they were in servitude to um, the other king for eight years, right? Now they're in servitude for 18 years. So I mean, almost 20 years. But then in verse 15, the Bible says, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. So here's another judge coming to um, help the people. It's mercy from God. Ehud, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. Hmm. And by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. Now it's interesting all these little details in the Bible that you get. You know, just, it just makes like reading the Bible interesting. You know, I mean, I mean these are, I mean, how, who could say the Bible is boring? I mean, these, these stories, I mean, first of all, I mean, if they point out that he's left-handed. Why is that? And that he is the one that goes, to, goes up to assassinate um, the king who has them under oppression. So here's some interesting facts for you. Um, about 90, uh, maybe 95%, it's tough to get an exact number, of people in the entire world, by the way, are right-handed. So everybody, pretty much, the vast majority of people are right-handed. Okay, this is why I think that the mark of the beast is going to be in the right hand, by the way. 
Because, you know, if you think about if we're going to put something in your hand, and this isn't really part of the sermon, we're going to put something in your hand, and we have to create a bunch of infrastructure and machines to read that thing. You know, everyone's right-handed. They're just going to choose the right hand, right? Because that's the hand everyone's used to using. But look, the overwhelming majority, and the interesting thing is that it is homogeneous across the world, this fact, that everybody pretty much 90 to 95% is right-handed. So turn to Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20. So we see that the Bible points out here that he's left-handed. Now this isn't serious doctrine we're going to get in. I just want to explain why the Bible points this out. Okay, look at Judges chapter 20 and verse 16. The Bible says in Judges 20 verse 16, it says, Among all this people there were 700 chosen men left-handed, and everyone could sling stones at an hair breadth and not miss. So look, it says that there was all these warriors, but 700 were special. They were chosen. They were left-handed. I mean, they were either trained to be left-handed or they were chosen because they were left-handed. All right, so look, the reason for this is because, I mean, I don't know if you've ever followed boxing or any kind of fighting or anything like this, but look, if you're, generally, if you're fighting someone who's left-handed, you are at a serious disadvantage. You say, why? It's because everybody that you train against to fight is right-handed. That's why. Okay, so when you, so, what are they doing? They're sword fighting. They're swinging swords. They're fighting in manual hand-to-hand -hand combat. And look, somebody that's left-handed, I mean, that throws a wrench in things. I mean, you have to train different against that person. And there's just not going to be that much training that you have against a left-handed fighter because there's not that many people that are left-handed. You see what I'm saying? If I have a, you know, a, a, a wrestling team or something, and, you know, there might be one person that's left-handed. You know, so it's tough to get a training against that type of individual. I mean, think about even, uh, I used to play a lot of baseball. Think about baseball. So I'm a right-handed batter, and I can hit with a lot of power to the left field because you're swinging the bat all the way around, and you get that momentum, and you can really, you can really just crush the ball to left field. It's very hard for me, a right-handed batter, to hit with power to right field. That's why everybody says that the worst player on your team, where do you put them? Right field. That's why. Because you can't hit with a lot. Most people, 90 to 95% of people, they just can't hit with a lot of power to right field. But then you get a left-handed batter that comes out, and he just crushes one to right field. You know, that's why he's such a powerful player on that team. Okay, if you can hit with power to right field. Okay, so look, it's just, it's a twist. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing that's unique and makes you a better fighter one-on-one -on -one, or better competitor one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, so that's why, and as we see, I mean, he goes in for a literal assassination mission here. Um, we'll see that that is an advantage to him. Go back to the story. Now, notice another thing. Notice how this guy went himself. So he was the judge, okay? So look, I mean, some things can be delegated in life, but some things shouldn't be delegated. This guy went I mean, something that's difficult and that is super important as a leader, you should just do yourself, okay? And even after you, I mean, you need to realize that some things are just too important to delegate. Um, they need to be done by you. That's just a side note. Look at verse 16 of Judges chapter 3. Verse 16. But, but Ehud, Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length. So a cubit is about 18 inches. They say a cubit generally is the tip of your finger to um, the bottom of your elbow is, is another measurement that I've heard, but it's about 18 inches. So we're looking at a, a knife, a small sword that's about a foot and a half long, and he brought and he, and he hit, he did gird it under his raiment under his right thigh. So he kept it on his, he's left-handed, he kept it on his right leg. And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an effort, now, I mean, we're going to get some more details here that maybe we didn't want to hear, okay? But here, here we go. This is the Bible, all right? And he that made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who, who said, keep silent. So he goes there and he gives this present so he can get close to the king. And there's all, then, then he's close to the king, and then he says, Oh, but King Eglon, I have a secret for you. I have a secret to tell you, a secret mission that I'm on that I can tell you. So this guy gets rid of everybody else. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in the summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand. 
and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Now, I mean, he was probably coming up to the guy with his right hand, either to shake his hand or to give him a hug with his right hand. In the meantime, his left hand is going up and getting the sword. So I'm sure that a king who is used to war and things like this, what hand is he probably watching on, on this guy to see if he's going to cause him harm? He's probably watching his right hand, okay, because everyone is right-handed, all right? And the haft, I mean the, the, the handle, also went in after, so he stabs him, he thrusts it into his belly, okay? And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. Okay, now I'm going to explain this to you. Okay, now as a, first of all, let me just say this. As a hunter, I completely understand this, this, this verse number 22. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Johannes if you'll come up here. Okay, so the Bible says he stuck the, the dagger into his belly and the dirt came out. Okay, so I mean it implies some kind of, you know, contamination or something like that. Okay, so as a, as a hunter growing up, so we always knew, I was always taught that when you shoot a deer, you're a deer. Okay, put your arms out like this like you're a deer. Okay, so when you shoot a deer, the where you're supposed to shoot the deer is right behind the shoulder blades. Okay, because what's up here? It's the heart and the lungs are up here. Okay, and you don't necessarily even have to hit the heart because both lungs are here and here. What you don't ever want to do, and you were, I was always taught this since I was this tall, is you never want to shoot a deer here. You never want to, what we would call gut shoot an animal. Okay, number one, the animal, you can go sit down brother, thank you. But number one, the animal would not die right away. And it would be a, a bad deal. We don't, you never want to have something suffer. You want to have a nice, um, a quick um, situation when you're hunting. But number two, it contaminates everything. You say, why? Because down here is your intestinal tract. Okay, so you go and you clean out or you, um, you field dress a deer after it's been killed. I'm sorry if I'm grossing you out, but this is, I mean, we're talking about the Bible here. You field dress a deer after you shot it in the proper place. There will be a lot of blood in the cavity because the animal has bled out internally. That's good. That's what you want, okay? What you don't want is to have the intestinal cavity broken apart because there's bacteria and that contaminates everything inside. It, it contaminates the meat of the animal, okay? It's contamination. So where did he stab um, Eglon? He stabbed him in the intestinal cavity, and this is what happened, okay? He, the dirt came out. That's the contamination came out, the intestinal tract um, of the man, okay? And that's as far as I'll get. I mean, the point is, is that, you know, the, the Bible's just giving you a lot of detail here on exactly what happened, and I mean, it's very clear, okay? so. Verse 23, so, so he's killed the man, okay? He has killed the man, um, he has stabbed him, he has killed him, and then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. So he closes the doors of his bedroom, his parlor, and he goes out, and when he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, surely he covers covereth his feet in his summer chamber. Now, I'm not going to get too much detail into this, but covering your feet in the Bible is used several times. Um, King Saul in the cave with David, it means he's using the restroom, okay? Covering his feet, obviously, you know, the, your trousers cover your feet, okay? So that's what that is talking about there. So they're, they're like, okay, he's, he's using the restroom in, in his parlor, is what they thought. And when he was gone out, his servants came, they saw that, and they, okay, verse 25, um, and they tarried till they were ashamed, so they waited and waited and waited and waited. And behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor, therefore they took a key and opened them. I mean, imagine. I mean, they probably gave him some time because, I mean, who wants to walk in on the king when he's using the restroom, right? I mean, that's probably not going to go well. So they probably, um, you know, gave him a lot of time. All right, so the Bible says in verse uh, 25 at the end, it said they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. And Ehud escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries and escaped into Sirith. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the Mount of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the Mount and he before them. So he kills the man. He, he has some time bought for him by locking him in his room and he gets away. 
I mean, so this is uh, it was pretty impressive. He assassinates the king and gets away. And then he says unto the children of Israel, he says in verse 28, Follow after me. The Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him. So, I mean, he's probably got some credibility at this point, too. I mean, he's like, hey, come, let's go to war. Why? Well, I just killed their king, so you follow me. I'm sure that, you know, it wasn't hard to get the entire nation to go to war after he um, did a feat like this. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty, all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. Now, this is another interesting um, point, but there's a reason that Ruth is right after the book of Judges, because um, this is the same time that Ruth and Naomi, so of course Naomi, um, her husband, he moved to Moab. There was a famine in Israel, and they moved to Moab. They, they were part of the people that moved to, amongst the, the heathen. They moved to Moab, and then their sons, um, Naomi's sons, married um, married these two women of Moab, of Ruth was one of them. Okay, um, the, only, the only virtuous woman in the Bible, the only woman, not the, that there's not any virtuous woman in the Bible, but of course Ruth is a great book, and Ruth is called a virtuous woman in the Bible. So of course, a lot of people think that in this war is where these two husbands were killed. Okay, because of course Ruth and her sister lost their husbands, and then that's when Ruth went back to um, Israel with um, Naomi. Okay, but that's just a, a side note. Same time frame at any rate. Okay, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years. So, how many years did the land have rest? Four score, four times 20, 80 years. Okay, and after him was Shamgar. So, here's your third judge. Now we have another judge, and we're not going to really get into Shamgar. There's only one verse here about him. But Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. So Shamgar, we don't know much about him in the Bible. We'll talk about him a little bit later. He's basically the judge between Ehud and Deborah is basically what we know about him. Um, Deborah, of course, coming up. But I mean, the Bible says that this man's no slouch. I mean, he, he slew 600 Philistines with an ox goad. An ox goad is like a... Uh, I, I, like a cattle prod, basically. Like a, a stick that you prod animals with. Okay, we would have called it a cattle prod um, when I was growing up. But so we don't know a lot about him. So let's look at a little bit of application tonight of Ju Judges chapter 3. Go back to verse number 1, if you would. So we see the first three judges. So we finally got judges in the book of Judges. All right, but let's look back at verse number 1. I just want to point out a few things here in uh, Judges chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now these are the nations with the, which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known the wars of Canaan. Look at verse number 2. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least, such as before knew nothing thereof. So tonight I want to give you, as just a little bit of application tonight, I want to give you two reasons that God lets you be surrounded by your enemies out of Judges chapter 3. So, I mean, the Bible's pretty clear here that there was two reasons that God left their enemies around them. And the first one, go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. The first reason that God, because look, God hasn't changed, all right? We are God's people, just like the, the Israelites were God's people. So the first reason that God will let you be surrounded by your enemies in your life is this. It's to prove you. It's to prove you. Did Israel pass the test? I'll just read for you verse number 4. You turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the others, and they took their daughters to be wives, and they gave their daughters and their sons and served their gods. Look, Israel failed the test. Israel failed the test. But before we get too hard on them, you know, think about, you know, maybe how are we doing today? How are we doing today? Do you think we're doing well today? I mean, I often think, I mean, we're coming up on, a, on a, an election season, right? So we'll hear these words, liberals and conservatives, and, you know, let's even say, I'll even give the conservatives um, a little bit of a, a benefit tonight, and I'll say a conservative Christian. 
How are the conservative Christians doing today? You say the Israel, Israelites failed, right? I mean, the enemies, look, the enemies around them, here's another thing. The enemies around the Israelites, and it applies to us as well. The enemies around the Israelites, they didn't have to fight them. They didn't have to fight them. They just had to hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, the Bible says. I mean, they didn't have to fight these people that were outside their borders. They just had to hearken unto the commandments of the Lord. You know, don't move in with them. Don't live with them. Basically, don't become them. Is, is, is what God put in front of them. Are you in 1 Timothy chapter 3? Look at verse number 10. What are we supposed to do? It's exactly the same. The Bible says, and let these also first be proved. He's talking about, so I just want to point, this is for me to point out what it means to be proved. He's talking about deacons in a church. He's talking about people that would be put into the office of a deacon, which is very similar to the qualifications for a pastor, but one of those qualifications is they're first proved. They're tested. Okay, they're not, you don't just say, hey, hey, you just, you just came to church here? You know, you're a deacon now. You know, no, you have to prove yourself. Look, do you have to prove yourself through your works and your deeds and all this to go to heaven? No, but you want to be a deacon in a church, you have to prove yourself. Okay, so that's what the Bible's saying. You have to be tested, and you have to pass that test. So how are the conservative Christians doing in our country? I mean, all the, all the Bible requires is that you don't become these heathen people. All right, look, they failed. Is the American, let, let me ask you this, is the American Christian standing up for anything today? Are they standing up for anything today? Are they standing up against sodomy in this country today, the American Christian? Are they standing up against just general immorality in this country, the American Christian today? No, they're not standing up against, mo most Christians today are joining in. All this immorality. These churches, you know, these churches that just, you know, these church, there's a lot of churches that might have the right gospel. But they're joining in. They're just changing and forgetting doctrines. They're just like, you know what? I just won't preach that part of the Bible. And then, you know what? Bring them all in. Bring them all in. Anything goes here. I mean, the American Christians are joining in with this stuff. I mean, they're just letting it all happen. And then, and then you'll find some that are really, oh, the, you know, the, the, the real hardcore Christians, you know, you hear this a lot today. The ones that, I'm not putting up with it, I'm moving out of California. I just heard another story like this, of someone actually moving out of California. What if the Israelites took this approach? Think about it. What if things got tough, and they're like, man, these wicked people, they're moving into our cities, let's go back to Egypt. Maybe a short Old Testament. I mean, be a short story, the children of Israel. That's not, I mean, these people are terrible. Let's get out of here. Let's go back. I mean, but isn't that really the attitude today? Retreat? I mean, California's a beautiful state. Why do we want to give it up to a bunch of freaks Amen. and immoral people? I mean, why would we abandon ship? You know, people, and then and here's another thing. These people in all these other states, and I know plenty of them, I've met plenty of them, I used to be one of them, all these people in other states are driving around in their pickup with their rifle next to them, and they're like, yeah, you know, we're tough, you know, and we're not going to put up with this. You know what? It's there too. And things happening here are going to, they're either happening now in those states and nothing's being done, or they're about to happen in those states. That's what those people don't realize. The same problems that exist here. Look, the blue-haired devils are coming to you too. Coming to a city near you. It's, it's going to happen. It's already happening. I used to live there. It's the same. You add a pickup and a rifle and some tough talk and gun shows. That's all it is. It's talk. And then I'm just going to, uh, the American Christian today, I'm going to watch Fox News until it changes. And if it doesn't change, I'm going to watch harder. <laughs> Nobody's doing anything. I mean, where did this attitude for Christians come from? That as soon as we get surrounded, we run away. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. What are we supposed to do? 
What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? I'll tell you one thing, we're not supposed to run away. We are not supposed to run away. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 17. The Bible is very clear what we're supposed to do. It says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. We're to be separate. Amen. Look, that's, what, that's why we preach what we preach here. All this stuff on all these standards and all this kind of stuff. Look, it's not about going to heaven. It's about being in good standing with your heavenly Father and, you know, hearkening unto the commandments of the Lord. As we're surrounded by our enemies, it's about not doing what they're doing. It's not becoming what they are. Right. And it's about, you know, that is what we're supposed to do. We must resist. We must separate. You know, that's what we're supposed to, That's why we teach separation here. It's the same exact doctrine that God had for the children of Israel. The exact same. Right. Nothing has changed. So, I mean, we must resist. We must separate. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing. And you know what? You can do it. It's possible. It's possible. You know, it's possible to separate from the school system. It's possible to separate from the world. Men, we have to go out in the world and work in the world. But we're not, you know, we don't become the world. That's why you need to be a strong Christian. Now, I mean, you can make the argument of what if it becomes illegal to separate? Okay, well, now we have something to talk about. What if it becomes illegal to, you know, first of all, it's not happening today. It's not illegal to homeschool your kids. It's not illegal to, you know, preach the Bible yet. Amen. I mean, I can see it coming, but it's not illegal. Okay, now what if it is, you know, illegal all of a sudden in a state to homeschool your kids? Well, now we have a problem. Because there's no way I would ever put any of my kids in public school. Never. Right. Knowing what we know now, so I mean, then you have a problem. Then you have to separate further, right? That's not running, that's separating. Separating. So first we see that, you know, we're to be proven. We're, we're, the, the reason that we're surrounded by all of this is there's many reasons for it, but the reason God allows us to be surrounded by our enemies is because that he's, he's, he's testing us. He's proving us. Okay, we are to hearken up to the commandments of the Lord. It doesn't matter how bad the enemies get. We're to hearken unto the commandments of the Lord. We're to love the Lord. We're not to become that. We're to separate. What's the second reason? The second reason is this. To teach the next generation war. That is another reason that God left the enemies around them. Now, I already talked about my grandpa, but I'm going to talk about him again. My grandpa, a couple years before he died, so my, my grandfather, you have to kind of understand this. It's probably difficult for, for people from California to understand this, but my grandfather was someone, and somebody in North Dakota, when, when I was growing up, we never really went anywhere. And especially my grandfather, he never went anywhere. You were on the farm in the middle of North Dakota. You never went anywhere. Going to town was like a special thing. And, you know, you never saw any of the world. Well, my grandpa saw the world in 1944. He saw the world in the South Pacific. He was in all these big theater engagements. He joined the Navy, and he was at Okinawa, he was at Iwo Jima, he was in the Philippines. All these massive things that if you've ever read about World War II, you've heard about these epic places, these battles. And he never, and then he came home after the war in 45, and he just never really wanted to visit anywhere else after that. I mean, he said many times, he said, and this is a common theme in North Dakota, my father-in-law is very much the same way. He went to Vietnam, and he fought in Vietnam for a long time, and he came back, and he just wanted to stay on the farm for the rest of his life. He's like, I've seen the world. I'm good. And, you know, the thing is, my grandpa never really talked about these types of things until the last couple years of his life. And then he started, and I should have recorded it. We would sit around the dinner table, and he would talk to me, and Garrett probably even remembers this, his great-grandfather, and he would talk about, you know, these situations, these battles. And he always talked about it from the perspective of, you know, how terrible it was. And, you know, all the people that they offloaded on the ships they never saw again. He's like, we offloaded all these, the, he drove a, a troop transport. Have you ever seen those in the movies? And he's like, you know, I, you get to know these people going over, uh, you know, it's a long boat ride to the South Pacific. You get to know these people, you drop them off, and you never see them again. And then you see the ones coming back. He just talked about how terrible it was. It was terrible. But yes, guess what? You can really never know war 
until you fought in one. You know, I mean, I, I've never been in a situation like that. And, you know, my father-in-law never, never talks about it. And I've had some friends who, who's, who've been to war that have, that have talked about it a few times, but you can never really understand war unless you've fought in a war. That, that's, that's the reality of, of war. And the problem is this, is that the Lord left those enemies there as a reminder that you always need the Lord. And as soon as they would turn away, the enemies would rush in, and then they would have to learn what war was about. Because it says the next generation after Joshua died and after the elders died, because those were the guys that fought the wars, the next generation knew nothing of the war. Well, they learned. They learned about the war. They literally found out how to fight war after they turned for the Lord. So the point that I'm trying to make here is there is no replacement for actual struggle. There's no replacement for actual struggle. This is why, and let me apply it here. This is why you should not strive to give your children this life of ease with no problems. That should not be your goal. No matter what they said to the next generation, what Moses said, what Joshua said, what the elders said, nothing could replace the actual struggles. Because the people that weren't involved in the actual struggle, struggles, turn to John 16. The people that weren't involved in the actual struggles, it didn't matter the words that they heard, they forgot. Turn to John chapter 16 and look at verse number 33. So the point I'm trying to make is that struggle is good for you. Okay, and please, uh, a little side note of what I'm not saying when I talk to your talk about raising your children. You will, you will meet, especially as you become separated Christians, you will meet these idiots in your life that will tell you that because you're homeschooling your kids and separating from the world and all these different things, that, hey, you need to let your kids experience some... They're, they're talking about letting your kids experience sin. You need to let them experience life. They're saying you need to let your kids experience sin. You need, they need to go out and, and fornicate and drink, and they need, to, they need a taste of sin. You will meet people like this. It is wicked as hell. That is not what I'm talking about. You, I mean, you rebuke those people openly when they say that to you. Because that is wicked as hell, and God forbid your kids hear that. Those people that are pushing that type of stuff, you keep those people away from your kids. Because those are the same type of people. Trust me on this. Listen. Those are the same type of people that when you are not around will plant seeds in your kids' minds about seeds of doubt, seeds of discontent about the life that they're living. Okay, look at John 16, verse 33. The Bible says, These things have I spoken unto you that in, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Struggle struggle overcoming actual challenges I'm not talking about sin overcoming challenges and and pushing through those things is good for you look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 18 the Bible says for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us it says that look we're talking about sufferings we're not talking about sin we're talking about tribulations we're talking about people that would persecute you that would put you in bad situations that would harm you or harm you know uh, a Christian for, for their faith the Bible says that what you suffer for that will not even compare to the glory that you will see Amen. turn to first Peter chapter 5 struggle Struggle will perfect you as a Christian. Struggle will perfect you as a Christian. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse number 10. The Bible says this, it says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory, there's that glory, by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect. So look, it says, after you've suffered, it will make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, settle you. Struggles and sufferings in this life will make you perfect. They will establish or establish you. They will strengthen you. Look, if you're older, you know what I'm talking about. They'll settle you. They'll strengthen you. They, look, it will make you stable. 
It will make you a stable person. That's why, you know, look, people who are older are generally going to understand this a little bit more because they've gone through more struggles. They've gone through more struggles in their life. But no matter your age, look, past, listen very carefully, past struggles should, should make you stronger. Amen. Past struggles, look, but they have the ability to weaken you. Past struggles have the ability to weaken you, but the Bible says that they should make you stronger. What am I talking about? If you're constantly, we preached about this a few weeks ago, if you're constantly looking back, if you're constantly angry about your past or something that happened or somebody that did something or did you wrong or whatever, if you're constantly looking back on that or resentful towards others, you know, that, by, by the way, that's why our instructions in the Bible Forgiveness is to be a one-way street. Look, ideally, if Brother George and I have a problem, if, you know, he does something wrong to me, ideally, he's like, sorry, I wronged you, brother. And I'm like, I forgive you, brother. That's the ideal situation. But I am to forgive him no matter what. Amen. Forgiveness is to be one way. Because that way, I move forward in my life. If I'm constantly looking back, that attaches me to him. I'm a, that's a weight to me. That's how struggle will hold you back. That's why you're supposed to forgive and you're supposed to move forward in your life. Look, it can slow you down or stop you, but it is supposed to strengthen you. Turn to Romans chapter 5. You say, how? Well, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the, how struggle, the Bible says, will strengthen you. Think, okay, now think, before we read this, think of a struggle that you have gone through. Think in your mind about a struggle that you've recently gone through or one that's uh, big in your past or whatever. Look at Romans chapter 5. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Funny how that glory keep, keeps coming up. Look, this glory is going to be so great you can't even imagine it. This glory. That's why, I mean, Paul is saying here, he's like, look, he's just like, whatever you're going through right now, it's like it's nothing compared to the glory. Right? But there's more. And not only so, he's like, but there's more. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Why? He's like, okay, there's this glory in front of us. There's this glory that awaits us. Eternal life. The glory is going to be like something we, we, we can't even imagine. He's like, but you can glory in the tribulations also. Why? That doesn't make sense. I'm supposed to glory in tribulations? Something bad is happening to me or happened to me, and I'm supposed to glory in that? Well, let's keep reading. We glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Notice the trend here. This is where struggle should take you. This is the trend. Think of a struggle you've gone through. You should go from tribulation to patience. What do you mean? I mean that sometimes when you're going through tribulation, you just got to grind it out. You just got to get through it. Right? You go through tribulation, and if you're thinking about a struggle that you've gone through, I'm hoping you're thinking about something you've gone through that's in the past. Didn't you come out of that? Aren't you here? Didn't you come out of that? Now you can look back and you're like, wow, I, I, I made it through that. That took some patience. That took some patience. So you have, look, you have confidence. You have now proved patience. If you have made it through that struggle. And you know you can be patient. I mean, there's some confidence there. I know I can do that. I, can know, I know I can come out of that. That's patience. And guess what patience leads to? When you know you can do something, you know, I know I'm, I'm pretty good at some things. You're going to get older, you get, I'm, not, I'm not good at other things, like, you know, reading names out of the Bible. But, I'm, I mean, look, you get, when you get experience at something, when you get patient, you get through something, you get what? You get experience. You get experience. So now, you've made it through, you prove patience, patience leads to experience. And whatever that, look, whatever that struggle was, you say, what do you mean experience? Whatever that struggle was, you are smarter and you are wiser now, are you not? Amen. I mean, look, look, whether it was your fault or whether it was not your fault, 
Now you know. Say it wasn't your fault. There was somebody bad doing something bad to you. Now you know. Now you know. Now you're wise. Now you know what to look for. Now you know the signs. And guess what? Guess what? People that have not experienced that battle, that have not fought that war that you've been through, they don't have that experience. You know what that means? That means you have the ability to be an incredible blessing Amen. to people. Do you know that? Because you know that if you've gone through something terrible. If you've gone through something terrible in your life, say you've met somebody evil and wicked, and you got that patience, you got through it, you have that experience now. Look, there's no, there's no replacement for war. There's no replacement for what you went through. Someone that didn't go through that, they, they can't understand what that's like. They may fall into something like that. But you have that experience now. And guess what? I mean, guess what? There's no replacement for... If I'm walking through a jungle, and I know nothing about jungles, it sure be nice to have somebody walking with me that knew every deadly snake and every deadly insect and everything about that jungle. Wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say it would be nice to have somebody with that experience? It would be great. Look, this is why, look, this is why, by the way, that you don't want to teach your kids to never have struggles. You want to teach your kids to never quit. Because there's going to be struggles. And if they struggle, and they get through struggles, and they get that patience that leads to experience, they get through those temptations and those tribulations, look, you will not always be there for these kids. Do you know that? You will not always be there. Back to our trend. Back to our trend. Remember that with your kids. You will not always be there. When you're raising these kids, it's not all about lollipops and fun. Now you're patient. Now you know you can handle things. You're experienced. You know how to recognize and deal with things. You know what this gives us? You know what this gives you? And it gives the people around you? You know what it gives them? Hope. It gives them hope. It gives those around you hope. You know, just like I said, it, it's nice to be around people that are experienced and wise when it comes to things. They can, they can help you. Because look, I, I mean, I'd rather not to have to have everybody go through the same war. Amen. Wouldn't you? You don't want to have to have everybody go through the same battles and the same struggles as you. So if you've gone through certain struggles, you can give hope to others that they won't have to go through those struggles. Hopefully kids, look, hopefully kids have parents like this, is all I can say. Parents that recognize that struggle is good. Because the ultimate, you know, we saw that, that tri it started with tribulation, right? It started with tribulation, tough times, struggles, and it ended with the best thing, hope. Hope in what? I mean, hope in ultimately the glory of God. It should not trip us up, these struggles that we go through in our life. It should make us stronger. It has the great possibility, if you are not listening to what the Bible says, to trip you up, though. Look, I mean, just take some parenting advice from God, from Judges chapter 3. That, that's all I have to say. Look, it, it's, it's parenting advice from the Lord. It's, it's, we don't want to do everything. He, he, he's surrounding us with enemies. Our children, they are going to go through struggles. We will not always be there. Let's remember what the Bible says. They, they need to be ready to be proven. Okay? There's teachable moments in everything. Don't ever forget that as parents. But don't ever forget that as individuals either, that these struggles in our lives, and I'm going to preach a whole sermon on this uh, one day, but these struggles in our lives, they are not supposed to trip us up. They're supposed to give us hope. And if they're tripping you up, you're looking at it wrong. You're looking at it wrong. Because the, here's the thing. If it trips you up, if your struggles in your life trip you up, you're not going to be that blessing to other people. You're not going to give that, because it's not just hope for you. It's hope for other people. You're like, man, that was rough, what I went through there. I don't want other people to go through that. I have that experience now. Now I have hope to give to everybody around me. Amen. You can be a great blessing to other people if we just follow um, what the Bible is teaching us. Judges chapter 3. 
Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.